Our solar system works like an incredibly large, incredibly precise clock in space. Observing and interpreting the night sky was the most important and sacred task in every civilization through history. But the findings of foreigners were also destroyed and misinterpreted. The search for the meaning of life often leads to the origins of human civilizations. Measurement means knowledge. That has been a maxim for research since the dawn of civilization. But not everything can be measured. And if we look at an old calendar that's still valid, we have fuel for wild speculation. We also have a good reason to look at the many other calendars that have existed in human history. A good place to start a search for the earliest signs of human civilization and its relationship with the cosmos is the county of Cornwall in the southwest of England. Here at Land's End, there are more witnesses to megalithic culture per square kilometer than anywhere else in the world. One relic that is widely known is Menantol, which means stone of the hole in Cornish. It was the source of many local legends, including a popular belief that it would cure the aches and pains of anyone who passed through it. <coughs> London-born graphic designer Ian McNeil Cook moved to Cornwall in 1969 lured by its landscapes and its history. And I went up to the stones, which are only half a mile from my house, um, early on a summer's morning. I wanted to see the shadows, because they were very interesting, how they move as the sun comes up. In the morning, the, the shadows change very quickly. And actually, when the sun first comes up over the hill, this shadow here, this stone, which is over here, goes right over the center of the hole. The actual first drawing of this stone was done around about 1750 by Dr. William Borlase, famous Cornish antiquarian. And his plan actually showed the centre stone in a slightly different position than it is today, a little bit off centre and at a slight angle. The time when the sun dies and is reborn at the winter solstice, many of these monuments have their passages or some sort of connection with that time. Megalithic construction, the creation of large stone structures, dates back 6,500 years. For centuries, these ancient relics were ignored by science. Today, many megalithic constructions have been excavated and restored. And much to the delight of amateur researchers, that work has sometimes paved the way for new experiences and profound impressions. So I sat there and the sky got brighter and brighter. And eventually the sun just popped up over the top of the hill and it shone straight down into my face. And it was actually quite a thrilling moment because I thought that it was very unlikely that anybody had ever done that for hundreds, if not thousands of years. Because um, that mound was actually excavated a few years before I was there. It was, it was a lot of debris in it and so on. Karnak in Brittany has become a byword for megalithic culture. It is the site of a unique collection of stone rolls, stone circles, single standing stones, portal tombs and burial mounds. The name Karnak means Stonehill 
and for anyone interested in the beginnings of European construction, a visit to this area in the south of Brittany is a must. At the time of the summer solstice, around 50 people gather for a seminar, with lectures and long walks around the megalith. For the participants and for organizer Howard Crowhurst, sunrise on the 21st of June is the absolute highlight of the event. The strengthening rays of the sun harmonize strikingly with the rows of ancient stones. I've been working on this subject for 25 years and since that time technology has advanced and the advancing in technology enables me to see how advanced the technology of these people was. So 25 years ago, we didn't have the technology necessary to examine these megalithic uh, constructions. According to the archaeological model, the people who lived here six to seven thousand years ago were hunters, nomads and farmers. From finds on the site, it is calculated that population density was no more than eight people per ten square kilometers. The monument of Gavrinus Island is of unparalleled size. Particularly remarkable is the 14-meter-long passage to the central chamber. The passage is designed so that the rising sun on the 21st of December shines straight into the burial chamber. If people come together to, to work together, you need a calendar because people have to be in the right place at the right time. And uh, that means structure, People have to obey, they have to believe in something. It, it, it implies a whole st structure over l large distances. Uh, and so the archaeological model, when you look at it, it doesn't work. Because you don't build massive megalithic monuments like that if you're primarily concerned about where your next meal's coming from. So all that means that the the present day archaeological model doesn't fit. So if that doesn't fit, what does fit? And immediately when you see the size and the scale and the precision of these things, because what I've shown through my work is that this is linked to very precise geometry uh, uh, and that geometry is very precisely orientated towards, the, with respect to the cardinal directions and when I say very precisely, we have a higher precision than the Great Pyramid on some of these north-south axes is over a very long distance. Even in the early Stone Age, human beings observed more than just the alternation of day and night and the phases of the moon. They also monitored changes in the night sky, as well as the movement of the planets. However, some scientists doubt that prehistoric man was capable of such complex calculations. Sardinia. The written history of the island starts in antiquity, but the landscape is littered with traces of much older cultures. From around 1600 BC onwards, the island was the center of the Nuragic civilization, named after the remarkable buildings it left behind, the tower fortresses known as Nuragi. More than 3,000 of these tower fortresses still exist today. The bronze figures of the Nuragic civilization were made around 2,800 years ago. Sardinia's soil has so far yielded about 500 of these statuettes, as well as many other relics. Sardinia's prehistoric monuments make it an incredibly interesting place, but it hasn't received much academic attention. We know so little about it that hardly anything has been written. The Nuragic Well of Santa Cristina is probably the most remarkable structure in Sardinia. It harbors an intriguing secret. Through this small hole at ground level, the moon is sometimes reflected in the water of the well eight meters below. But it only happens every 18 years between the end of December and the beginning of January. Could it be just chance? And there's another mystery. 
during the spring and autumn equinox, and only then the sun shines straight down the staircase onto the bottom of the well. Anyone descending the staircase to the well cannot help but look up and marvel at the precision with which the ceiling was constructed. Some believe it could be the work of the Sea Peoples. At that time, and somewhat earlier, there were big floods in Denmark and southern Scandinavia from which we know that hordes of people fled, apparently by sea. They were good seafarers, and some of them evidently ended up in the Mediterranean. At Medinet Habu in Egypt, there are temple reliefs showing Sea People warriors. Interestingly, wearing the same horned helmets that were worn at the time by Scandinavian fighters in the north. They were very bellicose people, and some of them evidently settled on islands, including the island of Sardinia. Felix Paturi studied high-frequency engineering and psychology, and has been a freelance science writer for more than 40 years. He is the author of over 40 books, including several bestsellers, which have been translated into 20 languages. Paturi has traveled widely, visiting more than 60 countries in every part of the world, and is considered an expert on shamanism. When I live outdoors, as Stone Age man surely did, I see the night sky above me. I also see that the whole thing is in motion, and there is a rhythm to that motion. I notice that certain constellations appear over and over again, and then, out of curiosity, I start to observe them. Those people weren't stupid, even though they're sometimes portrayed as such today. Stone Age man had an IQ just as high as ours. He observed and he made notes, and over the centuries and millennia, that automatically resulted in a calendar system. In the Black Forest near Fordwangen, not far from the point where the river Danube rises, is a gigantic lunar calendar of early Celtic origin. The royal tomb at Magdalenenberg on the outskirts of the small town of Willingen-Schwenningen. It has been established that the arrangement of graves around the central tomb fits the pattern of constellations in the northern hemisphere. This is the world's oldest Celtic site based on the cycles of the moon. It struck me when I was looking at the excavation plans in the museum. I enjoy a bit of stargazing on the roof terrace at night, and it struck me that I was looking at patterns that resembled constellations, the northern crown, the little bear and the dragon. I then fetched books from libraries and identified the rest, which was very easy. And it turned out that the sky that was depicted was that of the summer solstice. The constellations appear like that only at midsummer. The Museum of Ancient Shipping in Mainz home of the Institute of Pre- and Early History. Historian Dr. Aled Mees pursues a line of research that is not uncontroversial. It's got better in recent years. Since the Nebra disc became so famous, it's become accepted that even early man possessed a great deal of astronomical knowledge. It was previously thought that astronomy was so complex, requiring telescopes and other complicated equipment, that it couldn't possibly have been practiced in civilizations without a system of writing. Funnily enough, Caesar himself says in his De Bello Gallico, the Gallic War, that the Celts closely studied the movement of the stars, but archaeology chose to take no notice. The first official excavations at Magdalenenberg took place in 1890. Tomb raiders had got there first. The chambers were empty. Today all traces of excavation have been painstakingly removed, but a survey of the rows of wooden posts erected by the Celts shows the precise alignment of the timbers. You can see here that the sun rises here in the southeast in winter. 
That happens once a year. But the moon moves much faster. It swings back and forth all the time. Back and forth every month. And it rises here once every 18.6 years. Nine years later, it only goes this far. It rises here. And in another nine years and a bit later, at the end of the 18.6 year cycle, it rises here again, in exactly the same position. In the burial mound at Magdalenenburg, they found large posts rammed into the hill, heavy timbers aligned exactly with these positions. So everyone could see the ends of the moon's path on the horizon. No wonder Julius Caesar commended the Celts for their calendrial work. The numerous and sometimes widely differing lunar calendars of the Roman Empire gave rise to considerable confusion. As highest priest of the Roman state cult, the emperor introduced the 365-day solar year with an additional leap day every four years. But Caesar and his Egyptian astronomers underestimated one problem of the solar calendar, the cumulative effect of the imprecise Julian year. 365 Earth rotations take slightly less time than one Earth orbit around the Sun. A lunar calendar does not multiply discrepancies. It can be resynchronized every month when the lunar crescent is first sighted after the new moon. In Islam, the first visible crescent after the new moon marks the beginning of a new month and thus also a new year. As a result, the Islamic year consists of 355 days and starts at a point that gradually drifts through the seasons. The new year itself is not a cause for celebration in the Islamic world. It is a time for quiet contemplation of the Prophet Muhammad's emigration from Mecca. The most important lunar calendars are the Stone Age calendar, the early Roman calendar, the Islamic calendar and the Jewish lunisolar calendar. For Jews, the first sighting of the lunar crescent after a new moon also marks a new calendar cycle. Jewish New Year, Rosh Hashanah, always takes place in late summer or autumn and is marked by a feast reminiscent of a harvest festival. The Babylonians used a luni solar calendar, so do the Chinese today. Other examples are the runic and Celtic calendars of history and the calendars used in Korea and Tibet. How a luni solar calendar works can be described by looking at Chinese New Year. The sun's progression through the cycle of seasons defines a time frame, and the first new moon within that time frame marks the beginning of the year. For Chinese, the relevant new moon is the one between the 21st of January and the 21st of February. In 1949, Mao Zedong officially introduced the Gregorian calendar in China, a Western Christian system. Chinese New Year thus ceased to be an official national holiday. Lausanne is the Tibetan New Year and the most important holiday in Buddhist Tibet. It's a three-day celebration. Lausanne takes place in January or February, always on the first day of the first month of the Buddhist calendar. In Buddhism, the year is also geared to the Earth's orbit of the Sun, so festivals always fall within the same season. But the actual dates are defined by the lunar calendar, which again assigns the most significance to the full moon. Strictly solar calendars include the Zoroastrian, Christian and Japanese calendars, as well as the Mayan harp cycle and the Berber calendar. The Persian New Year Novruz dates back to the prophet Zoroaster. He stipulated that the spring equinox, the 21st of March, should be the start of the year. Novruz's tradition is precisely defined. Seven dishes are prepared, each with a name beginning with S. They symbolize the seven Zoroastrian virtues. 
Novruz is a spring festival with a history stretching back more than 3,000 years. Today it's celebrated by over 300 million people. Around 140 calendar systems have been identified, dedicated timekeeping systems developed not only by remote island communities and lost civilizations, but even by the forces behind the French and Russian revolutions. The historical record of calendar systems starts with cuneiform texts pointing to a sophisticated knowledge of astronomy in ancient Babylon. It's the Babylonians we have to thank for the convention of dividing the day into two 12-hour blocks. The Babylonian year consisted of 12 months, each of them starting at the first sight of the lunar crescent. And a new day started in the evening. The ancient Egyptian New Year festival started during the night. The new year itself arrived with the first rays of sunlight in the morning. All key elements of our present calendar system can be traced back to Julius Caesar. He was also probably responsible for moving the beginning of the year to 10 days after the winter solstice. Pope Gregory XIII's corrected some mathematical errors in Julian leap years by simply cancelling 10 days. The computing was done for the Pope by a German Jesuit priest from Bamberg. Christophorus Clavius solved the problem behind the decimal point by introducing additional leap days for each century. One of the great stars of astronomical history was Johannes Kepler, who started out studying theology and general science in Tübingen. During his time as a student, he became a strong believer in heliocentrism, the principle that the Earth orbited the Sun. The Middle Ages were history when Kepler was born, but the highest authority for the creation of calendars, and thus the highest authority on the celestial order of the universe, was still the Church in Rome. Kepler received an appointment as a mathematician in Graz, but was also expected to use his astronomer's art to look into the future for his Austrian masters. Johannes Kepler had to prepare horoscopes. It was one of his duties. It was what he was paid for, although he did it unwillingly. More than 400 years ago, in 1607, Andreas Plenninger created Johannes Kepler's calendar table. The top is made of etched and painted stone. In concentric circles with the globe of the Earth at its center, it sets out the calendar for every year, from 1600 to 1800, according to both the Gregorian and the Julian calendar. Around 1760, the table was acquired by Marian Pitreich, abbot of Rain Abbey, and the artwork has graced the monastery's library ever since. In 2012, it was loaned to the Joanneum in Graz for a special exhibition. What's really special about this table is the amazing amount of information crammed onto its surface which measures around two meters across. It starts in the middle with an astronomical symbol, the armillary sphere. Then we have the days, the days of the week, represented by gods and identified by name. And fringing that, we see details of the length of the days and the times of sunrise. We have the ring of animals, we have the number of days in the month, and we have pictures of the months for January, February, March, and so on. We have a picture showing activities typically performed in the month in question. And that's just the central part. Extending outwards from it is a perpetual calendar. Here, we have all 365 days of the year, with all the events that occur on the same day each year. For example, we have the saints that are associated with particular days, 
oder and the names of the stars that rise are set with the sun. And then there are the details important for calculating Easter. Many civilizations start their year with the awakening of nature in spring. Why Julius Caesar chose the 1st of January is not really known. Perhaps it was so he could get his armies to a remote part of the empire on time. In those days, battles were fought only in the warmer months of the year. But the names of some months are older than Caesar's calendar reform. Ancient names still in use today are September from Septum, meaning seven. October from Octum, meaning eight. November from Novem, nine. And December from Decem, ten. North of Klagenfurt, near Zangfeit an der Glan, the landscape is dominated by four impressive mountains. Excavations show them to have been sacred places for the Celts. The Celts lived here in the centuries before Christ, in a kingdom called Noricum, which was conquered by the Romans in 15 BC. One present-day custom, the Four Mountain Walk, is thought to date back to those times, although it has certainly changed over the centuries. The three to seven thousand people at the start at midnight today are here to walk as an act of Christian faith. But the date on which the walk traditionally takes place could be of Celtic origin. In the sky on the second Friday after Easter is a thin crescent or new moon. The fact that Easter is always celebrated on the Sunday after the first full moon in spring logically means that the new moon arrives two weeks later. A service in the small medieval church at Magdalenenberg marks the start of the pilgrimage. Good weather is certainly not guaranteed. When Easter is early because of the full moon rule, the walkers may even encounter snow. The crosses are carried by representatives of the parishes nearby and are adorned with boxwood, ivy, juniper and club moss. Pilgrims gather the plants by the roadside and, after they've been blessed, take them home for protection. Now you no longer need a headlamp to find your way, the priest tells the pilgrims at daybreak, but check that you have a spiritual headlamp. Let the Holy Ghost guide your footsteps. In the days before cinemas and clubs, the Four Mountain Walk is also reported to have been a popular opportunity for flirting. A 42-kilometer ramble certainly offers plenty of chances to get to know those around you. What does the diocesan bishop of Gurk have to say about the pre-Christian origins of the event? There's a kind of primal awareness of sacred places. Places that our forebears felt were sacred are also felt to be sacred now. Even in this age of high tech, of Facebook and Internet, we need to develop a feel for life, which means experiencing God's gift of nature and creation. When children sit at the roadside today, it's to wait for sweets from the ramblers. The origin of this custom has gone unrecorded. But in all civilizations that celebrate spring, the giving of small gifts is part of the tradition. The extraordinary thing about the Four Mountain Walk is that it's circular. That makes it different from all other pilgrims' trails in the world. By following a perfectly circular route, the Four Mountain Walk in Kempton is a rare event indeed. The Four Mountains symbolize the sun's course during the day. Ulrichsberg is the Sunrise Mountain. Feitsberg is the Midday Mountain. 
Lorentzberg is the Sunset Mountain and Magdalenenberg is the Midnight Mountain. They imprint that natural sequence on the landscape and those taking part in the Four Mountain Walk form a living mass tracing the four circle symbol of ancient Europe on the ground. Written records of the Four Mountain Walk are found in church annals from about 1500 onwards. As far as historians are concerned, it didn't exist before that. But the Four Circle symbol, the oldest symbol in ancient Europe, shows that the Four Mountain Walk dates back to much earlier times. The Externsteiner in the Teutoburg Forest in Germany is a distinctive sandstone rock formation and major tourist magnet. But that's not all. For people with a penchant for ancient customs, the rocks have a special attraction. Not surprisingly, they're a popular place for celebrating Walpurgis night on the eve of May Day. Wild parties have been held here in the past. Today, the local authority and the police keep a discreet but close eye on the revelers, which doesn't seem to spoil the atmosphere for those who turn up. Fifty-one days later, on the 21st of June, the rocks are a much quieter place. A small group of invited guests make for the Obra Kapelle, the upper chapel. A platform hoon on top of an outcrop, accessible only by a bridge. Now exposed to the elements, the platform was originally the floor of an enclosed chamber. It's oriented on roughly a southwest-northeast axis. It's said that on the longest day of the year, sunrise can be observed through this circular hole in the rock. The finely carved solid rock pedestal was probably once part of an altar. Damaged surfaces indicate where parts of this chamber collapsed or were destroyed. The alignment with the point where the solstice sun rises suggests that the room could have been used for astronomical observation. But the bad weather forecast proved right. Mist, clouds and not a single ray of sunlight. Better luck next year. In England, pagan customs have won official recognition. Gordon Rhymes is not only a kind of master of ceremonies for a druid community, he's also officially registered as a pagan. For him and those who share his beliefs, the year starts at a very late stage in the solar cycle. There are the eight festivals a year. From my belief, our year begins at what we call Samhain, which is known to most people as Halloween. And that is the time of the year when we talk with the ancestors and the Druids pass over the people that have died for the year. Um, we pass the spirit if somebody's lost somebody this year and, the, uh, and they want to pass over their spirit. Um, that's a, a thing we do on the night. The word pagan comes from the Latin paganus, meaning country dweller and adherent of local beliefs. Nature is considered sacred, a manifest expression of divine spirit. We 
have a, a saying that when we get married, you have a honeymoon. Um, and that comes from the fact that tradition was that you drunk mead for one loon a month after you got married. The, the couple would drink a glass of mead every night, which is honey wine. And there was a honeymoon. Now that's where your honeymoon comes from. And, and lots of things like that go back, way, way back. And, and they've just carried on down through time. Can the moon's position in the sky influence plant growth or the way hair grows? Many dismiss the idea as ludicrous. But a moon calendar with wisdom from the Tyrolean mountains has been a best-selling title for over 20 years. It's put together by Johanna Paunga and Thomas Popper and sells more than 300,000 copies a year. So this, this is where I grew up. That was the shortcut to school. And over there, a bit farther down behind the trees, was my parents' house, which is sadly no longer there because it burnt down. This place really shaped my life. But I think the big difference between me and other children who grew up in the area, or in Tyrol or Bavaria, is that I spent a great deal of time with my grandfather. My grandfather did lots of things based on the moon. And throughout my childhood, I saw that it worked. Why it worked or whether it worked was never an issue because the evidence was plain to see. In 1970s Munich, with her grandfather's backing and with what she had learned from him, Johanna Paunga became a popular advisor for a large group of friends. From private consultations, she went on to give lectures and then wrote books, which became bestsellers. Experience gathered over a very, very long time tells us that if you plant fruit on a fruit day, like Aries, Leo or Sagittarius, the fruit will be good. If I plant lettuce or another leaf vegetable, I do it on a leaf day, Pisces, Cancer or Scorpio. It all comes from experience. So all I need to do is look at the calendar, see what's coming up and decide when I want to do something. If I sow or plant out tomatoes on a fruit day or even buy seedlings from a garden center, I'll get good tomatoes. If I do the same on a flower day, the tomatoes will have wonderful flowers, promising a nice crop of fruit. But they'll flower and flower and flower. Tomatoes will develop, of course, but very late, and the last will go bad before they ripen. As yet there is no scientific evidence to support lunar law. The proprietor of a well-known Vienna hairdressing salon has made notes over a long period of time, but they don't reveal any significant lunar influence. You have to remember that there are always lots of factors involved. You can't simply say the moon makes everything possible. Nor does it prevent things happening. Lots of factors come together. But if you try it out and monitor the results, you'll see a difference. The customs, ceremonies and, of course, calendars of indigenous peoples are the scientific focus of English researcher and writer Geoff Stray. Most of his field work has been done in North and South America and he has spent more than 20 years studying the calendar of the Maya. In 2006, it was discovered that there is a monument that, that mentions the year 2012. From, and it's a classic inscription from the classic era. And it mentions that basically there will be the return of uh, the nine Maya gods of transition, the Bolon Yoktiku, which means the nine-footed god. And uh, he will return just as he was present at the beginning of the era 5,000 years ago. He will be present at the end. That's all we have really from the, the Maya as an indication of what they saw might happen at the end of this era. Bolon Yokti is also the god of war. Um, but generally speaking, this, this is seen as a birth process by the Maya more than a, a death process. It's seen as the birth of the new sun. It's a, a, the, the new creation. Uh, and when you then cross-reference that with other uh, indigenous beliefs about eras, 
like the Hopi, for example, believe we are in the fourth era, approaching the fifth era. There's seven altogether, so it's, it's not the end of the world, according to the Hopi. And the Maya have it, one, one era it finishes, it's replaced by another. It's got a new creation. Dresden, the city on the Elbe, capital of the free state of Saxony. A Baroque jewel noted for its outstanding architecture and libraries. Great importance has always been attached here to research and teaching. Since 1996, the campus of Dresden's University of Technology has been the home of the Saxon State Library. In the treasure chamber, behind heavy duty glass and in very low lighting, are the most precious items in the library's collection. Medieval Bibles, historical globes and notebooks penned by Johann Sebastian Bach. Yet none of them possess the magnetism of an exhibit from much farther afield. The Dresden Maya Codex. Librarian Katrin Nitschke has been professionally involved with the Codex for more than 30 years. Can she explain its special appeal? I don't have any explanations, but I do know that the Maya had observatories and that they were very knowledgeable about the stars and their influence on the climate, catastrophic events and so on. That is a rare accomplishment. For a long time, it was thought there were no highly developed civilizations in America. So it came as a surprise to find that they had a written language and such an advanced knowledge of mathematics. The story of the Dresden Maya Codex reads like a historical adventure novel. It starts with Diego de Landa from Toledo. In his religious zeal as Bishop of Yucatan, he Christianized the indigenous Maya using the tools of the Inquisition. In 1562, his notoriety peaked when he ordered all Mayan books to be burned. Nevertheless, almost 180 years later, a well-preserved Maya manuscript turned up in Baroque Vienna. It was purchased in 1739 for the Royal Library in Dresden. As a result of that momentous acquisition, descendants of the ancient Maya today travel to Saxony to see the only written relic of their heritage on public display. Good news is no news. So how can you play up a new cycle of an old calendar? by interpreting it as the end of an era, of course, or, preferably, the end of the world, with a heavy media wink. The claim that the Mayan calendar predicts the end of the world is based mainly on one particular illustration in the Codex. It's not an apocalypse. It's a flood. You see a celestial crocodile spouting water from astral openings, being helped by two deities the old moon goddess with a snake on her head, and the god of the underworld with a screech owl on his head. But the most important thing, really, is the pot of water in the old moon goddess's hand, which she's tipping and pouring. Inside it is the sign for five ep. It means the fifth day of the month of ebb in the Tzolkin calendar, which is a ritual calendar. If that day falls at the beginning of the rainy season, there is a risk of a major flood. But there's a problem with the Tzolkin calendar. Because it's shorter than the solar calendar, that day can also fall in spring or autumn. Unlike a day in the farming calendar, it doesn't always come around at the same time. It's only when the two components coincide, rainy season and five ebb, that there is a risk of a major flood. That's all it means, no more, no less. So the fantasy world of the ancient Mesoamericans may be defined, after all, by calamity. 39 double-sided sheets, 74 pages of extremely fine penmanship, folding out to a length of three and a half meters. And at the end of the codex, on the very last page, is a moon goddess pouring water. 
It's not the last page. It was cut out of the Codex, probably in 1835, and placed at the end of this section. We believe, although we can't prove it, that it comes from the middle of a pictorial sequence. It's not an end panel. But it looks good and it has a picture on one side, and that's why it may simply have been repositioned and placed at the end. Ich setze das einfach am Schluss dieser einen Bildtafel. The astronomer priests of the Maya, the Babylonians, the Assyrians and even the Greeks were aware of the natural cosmic phenomenon known as precession. The planet Earth behaves in space like a giant spinning top. After about 10 million rotations around its own axis, approximately 26,000 years, the Earth completes a cycle in which its axis traces out a cone. The ancient astronomers registered and computed this movement, during which the night sky seen from Earth shifts by one degree every 72 years. Today the cycle is known as the Platonic Year. The principle of precession was also known to the designers of the Antikythera mechanism. On show in the Archaeological Museum in Athens is an exhibit that is the only one of its kind. An exhibit that, according to conventional history, shouldn't actually exist. There are fragments of a computer with numerous bronze gear wheels. They date from 100 BC. Since the mechanism's discovery in 1903, these three remnants have presented puzzles. X-rays and 3D scans provide assembly instructions and many attempts have been made to reproduce the device. Few models have been completed. However, after nine months' work in a small workshop near Genoa, astronomer Morghi Vicentini succeeded in building a working mechanism based on the Antikythera manual. Just the inscription on the Antikythera machine, the parapegmata, which have been uh, studied and uh, translated, it uh, appears like an uh, instruction manual uh, for both uh, reading and also building such a device. It was um, a machine designed for demonstrating purpose, most probably because it is too little to be used uh, like a calculator. But it, demo it demonstrates uh, how much and how deep was the knowledge of the Greek at that time. The instrument could reproduce the course of the sun, the moon and the planets that were known at the time. It divided the year into 365 days and even took account of a leap year every four years. It could predict lunar and solar eclipses and the appearance of certain constellations in the night sky. All that with astonishingly sophisticated engineering and a probable total of 37 gear wheels. What did the man who made the replica find most impressive? The technical difficulty, because I relied on very simple tools and uh, I wonder how the Greeks could make such a, a work with uh, tools not <laughs> like uh, mine. I have an old late uh, bench drill and hand tools, but uh, as they are built today with hard steel and uh, good uh, cutting techniques, but they didn't. So uh, at last I wondered how the, did they do. This is the most intriguing question for me, still an open question. Another unsolved mystery is where such a device could have been designed. A device capable of precisely computing and identifying every solar and lunar eclipse for 54 years. It's assumed that a large team of experts worked four years on its development. What could have been the reason and motivation for such a gigantic engineering project? We know that Greeks uh, had a very strong passion for geometry. They solved all their problems with the use of geometry. So it is not strange 
to think about uh, derivation of geometry, if uh, we can call it, uh, which is mechanics. And it is not so strange that uh, from that kind of knowledge they got uh, also uh, mechanical achievements. Just uh, let's think about uh, Archimedes machines. Greeks and Babylonians, Egyptians and Romans, Jews and Muslims. They and many other civilizations and religions had or have a calendar of their own. But so far only the astronomers of the Maya seem to have managed to focus the whole world's attention on a single date.